Uh, this talk is on uh, egoism and altruism, and the subtitle, uh, for reasons you'll see soon, is deconstructing the debate, uh, a term that uh, I like to use often because it seems to me a perfectly nice term and the bad guys shouldn't get to keep it. All right, uh, so a bit of introduction uh, about the problem and where we're going. Uh, psychological egoism uh, and psychological altruism uh, are theories that offer conflicting accounts of human motivation. Uh, and throughout these slides, I'll just use psi egoism and psi altruism uh, for brevity. Uh, the debate between the psychological egoists and the psychological altruists has, of course, been raging for centuries. Clearly, since Hobbes, some of my scholarly friends tell me uh, that it's actually been going on since Plato, and I'm happy to believe that if it's true. Uh, in the last quarter of the 20th century, uh, the debate was joined uh, by a growing number of psychologists and biologists. My own view uh, on uh, that uh, recent development uh, is that some of the most interesting work has been done by uh, this guy, my friend Dan Batson, uh, and his colleagues who uh, I think have made more progress on the debate between psychological egoism and psychological altruism in the last 30 years uh, than has been made in the previous 400. Although I don't agree with Batson, uh, <clears throat> uh, who claims that in fact his work has largely resolved the debate between psychological egoism and altruism by showing that altruism is true. Uh, but that part of the story uh, is for another occasion. Uh, so on some other occasion, perhaps I'll, I'll be able to tell you why I disagree with uh, Batson uh, on a number of points. Uh, the biological arguments, uh, on my view, have been uh, much less successful and productive. Uh, indeed, uh, one of my themes in this talk is that the biological arguments have contributed very little uh, to the resolution of the debate between egoism, psychological egoism, and psychological altruism. But I'm also inclined to think that one recent uh, um, biological argument, an argument for the existence of psychological altruism, uh, makes a contribution, albeit inadvertent, of another sort. Uh, <clears throat> it's made it clear that the traditional debate between psychological egoists and psychological altruists has been fought in too narrow a ground. Uh, the disputants have taken much too narrow a view of the kinds of cognitive architecture that might underlie human motivation. And when that restrictive assumption is abandoned, uh, I think it tends to undermine the traditional debate uh, in a rather unusual way. Uh, because it challenges the pervasive assumption amongst moral, psych moral philosophers uh, that we, in fact, as moral philosophers, have to worry about psychological egoism. So uh, that's the deconstruction uh, of the debate uh, that I want to develop in this talk. Uh, but before doing any of that, uh, I'm going to have to spend a fair amount of time talking about the biological arguments and defending my claim that they haven't advanced, uh, certainly haven't resolved the debate between psychological egoism and psychological altruism. So quick overview of where I'm going in the rest of the talk. First, I want to say a little bit about why philosophers care about the debate between egoism and altruism. Actually, not an easy question to answer, as you'll see. Uh, and then, whoops, sorry about that. Uh, and then uh, I'll talk about the evolutionary arguments, both uh, evolutionary arguments against altruism and evolutionary arguments for altruism. Prior to that, I'll need to say something about this crucial distinction uh, between uh, <clears throat> evolutionary uh, and psychological accounts of altruism. And then finally, at the end, I'll come back to my deconstruction uh, saying why I uh, think that uh, moral philosophers maybe need not worry about psychological egoism. All right, so let me start uh, with the question why philosophers care. Obvious place to start, of course, is with Hobbes, uh, who famously tells us, no man giveth but with intention of good to himself, because gift is voluntary. 
and of all voluntary acts, the object is to every man his own good, of which if men see they shall be frustrated, there will be no beginning of benevolence or trust, nor consequently of mutual help. All right, so what's Hobbes telling us here? He's telling us that all human motivation is egoistic. Of course, Hobbes wouldn't deny for a moment that people sometimes help each other. Uh, but he's claiming they do this only because they believe that helping, each other, helping other people will result in some benefit for themselves. And if they didn't believe this, Hobbes, telling, uh, Hobbes tells us, uh, benevolence and mutual help will come to an end. Well, other philosophers, uh, including uh, other uh, classical philosophers, have taken a less pessimistic view of uh, human motivation. They grant that people are often motivated by self-interest, uh, but they insist that sometimes, at least, people also act altruistically, that is to say, not motivated by self-interest. Uh, sometimes they're motivated only by a desire to promote the well-being of somebody else. Uh, now, I said uh, you can find uh, classical philosophers advocating this view. No problem, by the way, finding contemporary philosophers advocating this view. Turns out to be remarkably hard to find a clean case. I'd love, by the way, those of you, probably everybody in the room who's a better scholar than I am, uh, anybody who can give me some examples of really clean cases amongst classical figures, I'd love to see them. This is the closest I've come. Uh, Adam Smith, surprisingly, of all people, says, how selfish soever man may be supposed to be, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortunes of others and render their happiness necessary to him. And if only he had shut up there, I'd have my case. But then he goes on to say, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it, uh, which muddies the waters a little bit because it's not so clear he's being, he's advocating uh, altruism. So it'd be nice if he just didn't say that, uh, but he did. All right, well, this debate, it seems at least, is a debate about the nature of human motivation. It's therefore a psychological debate, and it raises an interesting psychological question. But the question I want to address for a few minutes is, why do moral philosophers care which side is right in the debate about psychological egoism? And that's not an easy question to answer, actually. Uh, some philosophers uh, <clears throat> claim that altruism is either central to or necessary for, or you can even find people saying altruism is identical with morality, uh, and this, by the way, is just a remarkably easy view to find. Uh, <clears throat> I set out to do some research on this by pulling handbooks off my shelf uh, and ended up with 15 or 20 very clear quotes. Here are just a few from very sensible, clear-headed people. Uh, so Jim Rachels, the late James Rachel, says, moral behavior is, at the most general level, altruistic behavior. Motive... Uh, uh, motivated by the desire to promote not only our own welfare, but the welfare of others. Uh, Bill Schroeder uh, tells us that one central assumption motivating ethical theory in the analytic tradition is that the function of ethics is to combat the inherent egoism or selfishness of individuals. Indeed, many thinkers define the basic goal of morality as selflessness or altruism. In fact, Schroeder's an old friend of mine, I got in touch with him and said, who did you have in mind here? Can you give me some quotes about these thinkers who say this? He couldn't. Right. Uh, well, it's important to see that that view, the view that somehow altruism is either a necessary condition uh, of or uh, perhaps even identical with morality, that's a very extreme position. And indeed, it's an extreme position for which I have uh, been unable to find a single serious argument. I have a standing offer, by the way, a really good bottle of wine to anybody who can, it doesn't have to be a you know, convincing argument or a sound argument, but at least a reasonably serious argument that anything like this is true. You find people saying it over and over again, uh, but it's just remarkably hard, I found, to find any serious defense of that claim. Uh, and furthermore, of course, there are many figures in the history of ethics 
who would flat out deny it. Kant, perhaps most famously, uh, Kant tells us uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that uh, an action which is motivated by altruistic motivation uh, doesn't achieve true moral worth for Kant in order to achieve true moral, moral worth, you have to be motivated by duty, not by altruistic motivation. All right, so why should philosophers, if, if it's not identical, if morality and altruism aren't, aren't identical, as people say but never argue, uh, why should philosophers be concerned with psychological altruism? Well, I think the place to look uh, is to go back to Hobbes' uh, original quote. Uh, so <clears throat> notice what Hobbes is telling us here. He's telling us that if egoism, psychological egoism, is true, then helpful or pro-social behavior is going to be very fragile. It's going to be easily undermined uh, because if people don't believe there's something in it for them, they aren't going to engage in pro-social behavior. So uh, that's the crucial idea I'm going to pick up and run with. And of course, it's been uh, <clears throat> a crucial idea for a lot of other figures as well. Uh, Jeremy Bentham uh, and John Stuart Mill uh, were both similarly concerned with just this issue. Uh, it's a part of the views of the classic and utilitarians, by the way, which many people don't know much about. I certainly didn't until I got into this particular literature. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, of course, famously, both Bentham and Mill were egoists. Uh, in the first sentence of Bentham's Principles of Morals and Legislation, you know, man is the servant of two masters, pleasure and pain. He's a, not only an egoist, uh, he's a hedonist, as I'll explain the notion in a few minutes. Okay? But this creates a problem, right? If you're a utilitarian, if you're a utilitarian, you think that what people should do is what will engender the greatest good for the greatest number, right? But uh, if you're a psychological egoist, then you think that the only thing people are motivated to do is the action which will engender the greatest good for the numero uno, for yourself, right? And that creates a tension. And both Bentham and Mill were actively aware of that tension and in fact said, stop it, uh, said so, oh, this is not good, what's happening here? Uh, Maybe I'll have to use that. Uh, said some uh, <clears throat> really surprising things. Uh, they made some very, very draconian suggestions about uh, <clears throat> how you should organize society. Uh, for example, persuading people of religious views that in Mill's case, I take it, uh, <clears throat> he specifically believed to be false, right? But <clears throat> you know, if you persuade people that they'll suffer in hell if they don't do the greatest good for the greatest number, okay? These are remarkable things uh, to find in, in the work of people like John Stuart Mill. All right, so I've said a little bit about why uh, philosophers care about egoism and altruism. Let me now turn to the question of whether evolutionary theory uh, can resolve the debate. And uh, in order to even get one's foot in the door here, one needs to start by being very, very very, very, very clear uh, about a crucial distinction, the distinction between psychological altruism and evolutionary altruism. So let me talk a little bit about this. It's really important to be clear that the kind of altruism uh, that moral philosophers are concerned about is psychological altruism. Okay? To say that a behavior is psychologically altruistic is to make a claim about the motivation of the behavior. A behavior is psychologically altruistic if it's motivated by ultimate desires for the well-being of others. Now, there's a lot of jargon in here that needs to be unpacked. Uh, first of all, uh, we need to say what it is to be motivated by ultimate desires. And secondly, we need to say what it is uh, to be a desire for the well-being of others. I'll start with the second one. Uh, there's a lot to be said about this, but for the purposes of this talk, I think we can rely on uh, some intuitive examples. So, for example, a desire to save somebody else's life, to alleviate someone else's pain, to cure someone else's illness, or to make someone else happy, all of these are desires for the well-being of someone else. Uh, so those are the paradigm cases there. 
uh, <clears throat> what it is to be motivated by a particular ultimate desire needs a bit more theoretical underpinning and explication. Uh, the intuitive idea here is clear enough. Uh, a desire is ultimate, and by the way, maybe I ought to say uh, that uh, just like the term altruism, the term ultimate is used in two very, very different senses in this uh, <clears throat> literature, and it's crucially important to keep them separate. Ultimate desire is one thing, ultimate or evolutionary explanation is another thing, and they have to a good first approximation, as my colleague Jerry Fodor would say, exactly nothing to do with one another. All right, All right so an ultimate desire uh, <clears throat> is something that you desire for your own sake rather than because you think that uh, satisfying the desire uh, <clears throat> will, uh, or, or will lead to the satisfaction of some other desire. Now I think this crucial notion can be made clearer uh, if we pick up and run with one interpretation, certainly not the only one, but one interpretation or one theory about the traditional notion of practical reasoning. Well, on this interpretation that I have in mind, uh, practical reasoning is a causal process. Uh, it's a causal process via which a desire and a belief either give rise to or sustain a new desire. So, for example, uh, if I form the desire to have uh, <clears throat> some great sorbet, uh, and I believe that Bertillon, which is clearly any sensible person would because it's true, if I believe that Bertillon makes the best sorbet in the world, uh, then I'll form a desire to go to Bertillon. And if I believe that the best way to get from here to Bertillon uh, is to take the metro, then I'll form a desire to take the metro, and so on. Graphically, the picture looks like this. I've got a desire to get a sorbet, the belief, uh, desire to go to Bertillon, uh, <clears throat> and so on. Ultimately, of course, ending up uh, with what I used to think was the best sorbet in the universe, uh, that's the cassis. But I've now discovered that there may be a better one, the fruit de passion is even better than the cassis. All right, uh, <clears throat> and I blame all of you for the six or seven pounds I'm going to gain while I'm here. All right, uh, um, <clears throat> so desires formed or sustained by practical reasoning, a pattern like this, are instrumental desires, but of course, uh, if we're to avoid either uh, circularity or infinite regress, not all desires can be instrumental desires caused in this way. And the desires that aren't the product of practical reasoning are the ultimate desires by definition here. That's just what ultimate desires in this literature means. So the picture is this. These guys are the instrumental desires, and that guy is an ultimate desire. And this picture provides us with another way of explaining or illustrating the difference between psychological egoists and psychological uh, altruists. Uh, so both egoists and altruists think it's possible that I have a desire to save John's life uh, if, for example, uh, I also believe I'll get a large reward for doing that. But Altruists think that this is also possible. Altruists think it is psychologically possible that I have an ultimate desire to save John's life, whereas egoists would deny that this is possible. And also uh, a good way to point out uh, with regard to this diagram, that hedonists, who are one historically important uh, subcategory of uh, egoists, uh, hedonists maintain uh, that not only are all ultimate desires self-interested, the general ego is claimed, but there are only two kinds, right? Uh, there's the desire for pleasure and the desire to avoid play, pain. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, certainly Bentham, probably John Stuart Mill, I'm not quite so sure about that, uh, but Bentham was clearly that kind of uh, egoist. He was a hedonist. All right, uh, so uh, I'm working on explaining the difference between psychological altruism and evolutionary altruism. Uh, said enough about psychological, let me switch to uh, evolutionary altruism. Here, uh, the idea is that a behavior, or perhaps a disposition to behave, is evolutionarily altruistic if and only if it decreases the inclusive fitness 
of the organism exhibiting the behavior and increases the inclusive fitness of some other organism. Where inclusive fitness is roughly uh, a measure of how many copies of an organism's genes exist in future generations. There's, of course, a huge literature in the philosophy of biology trying to get rid of the roughly over here. Uh, but for our purposes, we needn't worry about it. All right, so an organism can increase its inclusive fitness in two ways, either by reproducing or by doing something which either directly or indirectly helps kin, helps kin to reproduce. Uh, so behaviors that help kin to reproduce, typically at least, are not evolutionarily altruistic. And it's important to keep in mind that in this biological literature, in this evolutionary literature, behavior is interpreted very broadly, broadly enough so that paramecia, or indeed even plants, can behave uh, <clears throat> and therefore potentially behave altruistically. Well, a crucial uh, fact here for keeping, <clears throat> for thinking straight about these issues is that evolutionary altruism and psychological altruism are logically independent notions. Neither one entails the other, although much of the literature, as I'll say several times, much of the literature in this area has been profoundly obscured by people who have lost track of this fact. Okay? But let me make it clear to you that neither one entails the other. Uh, so, first of all, evolutionary altruism without psychological altruism. It's possible, and here all I mean is conceptually or logically possible, it's logically possible for an organism uh, to exhibit evolutionary altruism even though it has no mind at all. And if it has no mind at all, of course, it has no uh, ultimate desires of any sort, uh, so it can't possibly be a psychological altruist. So it's important to keep in mind uh, that from a conceptual or logical point of view, plants and, even, um, and paramecia can perfectly well be evolutionary altruists. They couldn't possibly be psychological altruists. They ain't got minds. All right, what about the other way around? Psychological altruism without evolutionary altruism? Well, if an organism has ultimate desires for the well-being of its offspring, it is, by definition, a psychological altruist. To have ultimate desires for the well-being of some, some other organism makes you a psychological altruist. Okay? Uh, but, of course, the helping behaviors that such an organism would engage in typically uh, would not be evolutionarily altruistic uh, since by uh, <clears throat> having ultimate desires for the well-being of your offspring and helping your offspring, uh, you're typically increasing your own, that is to say, the parents inclusive fitness. Uh, so here we've got uh, <clears throat> uh, psychological altruism without evolutionary altruism. All right, uh, there's the distinction that I need. Now let me plunge into arguments. Uh, and much of the literature, uh, in fact, uh, <clears throat> in recent years has been on this side, evolutionary arguments against altruism Although I think there's almost nothing to be learned uh, from that literature. Uh, let me say briefly why. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, many, uh, uh, many evolutionary theorists uh, think that evolutionary altruism, this is a controversial view, I'll come back to it, but many evolutionary theorists think that um, evolutionary altruism is biologically impossible or perhaps biologically impossible in a species which reproduces the way we do. And you can find instances of this all over the place. Uh, this is perhaps the most famous quote. The biologist Michael Geslin says, scratch an altruist and watch a hypocrite bleed. Okay? But some people have gone on to claim uh, that because, uh, 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 that because uh, evolutionary altruism is psychologically impossible, uh, that psychological altruism is biologically impossible as well. And it's really important to uh, see uh, that um, if you think that's the case, you need a careful and detailed argument, which is, I claim, never forthcoming. There's no easy or obvious way to go from the claim, assuming it's true for a moment, that evolutionary altruism doesn't exist, 
to the claim that psychological altruism doesn't exist. Certainly, you can't do that in one step, as too often gets done in the literature. Sorry about that. All right, well, it's also been suggested, and these are more subtle and interesting arguments, it's also been suggested that um, although evolutionary considerations don't rule out psychological altruism, they restrict it in important ways. Uh, in particular, that evolutionary considerations impose important uh, constraints or limits on the scope of, of psychological altruism in, human, in humans. Uh, the argument usually is developed along the following lines. So, first claim, psychological altruists are disposed to help others, even when the helping behavior lowers the likelihood of their own reproductive success. And, second claim, there are only two ways in which dispositions of this sort could evolve, via kin selection and via reciprocal altruism. So, let me say a bit about kin selection, well, I assume most people in the audience uh, know about it already. Uh, derives from the work of uh, the late William Hamilton, who showed how genes leading to costly helping behavior could spread through a population, provided the recipients of the costly helping behavior are kin. Okay? Reciprocal altruism, uh, an idea uh, usually attributed to my Rector's colleague, Bob Trivers, uh, Trevor showed how dispositions to help could have, in, indeed even costly helping, could evolve when the episodes of helping are part of an ongoing or longer term reciprocal strategy where the recipient of help on one occasion is the donor of help on another occasion. So you help people who have helped you or who you expect to help you. Uh, and Trevor shows how a disposition of that sort could become stable in a population. Uh, so, the argument continues, it's biologically possible for organisms to have ultimate desires to help their kin, that's Hamilton, okay? And it's biologically possible uh, to have dispositions to help non-kin with whom you're engaging in or expect to engage in an ongoing reciprocal altruism relation. But apart from those two special cases, the argument goes, uh, uh, psychological altruism can't evolve. Well, though this argument has been remarkably influential, and i give you references if you'd like, uh, I think it is far from convincing. So there's the argument, and what I'm going to suggest is there's very good reason to be extremely skeptical of that premise. Well, what are the reasons? Uh, I'll give you three. Uh, first of all, it's, it's long been recognized in the literature that group selection, that is to say the kind of selection in which one group of individuals leaves more descendants than another group, can lead to the evolution of helping behavior. But until recently, at least, the reigning orthodoxy in evolutionary theory has been that group selection is very unlikely to occur in a species like ours. Uh, <clears throat> this view has been uh, boldly challenged in the last uh, 10 or 15 years uh, by Elliot Sober and David Sloan Wilson. I think I'm going to yank this and do it by hand because I think what's happening is the battery's dying in here. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, while the uh, Sober and Wilson uh, um, arguments are uh, very controversial, uh, what I think is that it's at this point an open question the extent to which group selection is involved in uh, human evolution. Uh, oops, there we go. All right, but uh, <clears throat> uh, much less controversially uh, on this uh, score, uh, Rob Boyd and Pete Richardson have developed models uh, that show how helping behavior, indeed, a bit more dramatically, they show how just about any sort of behavior can evolve if informal punishment is meted out to individuals who don't help in circumstances when it's expected. And uh, the third consideration, a uh, former uh, collaborator of mine and former student, Chandra Srapada, uh, has recently argued that there's yet another interesting way in which ultimate desires for the well-being of others could have evolved in humans. So here's Srapada's idea. He says, there are many situations in which people are better off if they act in coordinated ways, 
but where there are several different ways of acting, uh, so long as we're coordinated, no one way is better than another. Uh, the obvious kinds of intuitive examples here are that we drive on the left or we drive on the right. Neither one's better than the other, but it's a darn good thing that we all do the same thing. Uh, these are situations in which there are different coordination equilibria, all of which may be equally adaptive. Well, what is natural selection going to do to deal with this problem, Srapada asks. One way that natural selection could deal with the problem uh, is to produce a psychological mechanism that generates ultimate desires to adhere to the locally prevailing customs or practices. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> whatever the local coordination equilibrium is where you happen to be, you form an ultimate desire to uh, adhere to that coordination equilibrium. But since some, at least, of these locally prevailing customs will require helping others, some ultimate desires produced by this kind of mechanism might well be psychologically altruistic. All right. Well, if Boyden, Richardson, and Srapada are right, and I think they are, then, the evol then evolutionary theory just gives us no reason to suppose that psychological altruism must be restricted to kin or to individuals in, with whom we're engaged in a reciprocal exchange. Uh, so uh, <clears throat> that part of the argument uh, is wrong, and the argument dissolves. And I couldn't resist. You can do this with PowerPoint. There, the argument has just dissolved. <laughs> All right. So, so much for evolutionary arguments uh, <clears throat> against altruism. Uh, what I want to focus on now is uh, a rarer and in some ways very much more interesting and closer to being right, I think, an evolutionary argument for altruism. Uh, this is to be found in the work of Elliot Sober and Dave Stone Wilson in the last half of their book, Unto Others. And what Sober and Wilson do is focus on the case of parental care. Now, this is a very wise decision from a strategic point of view on their part. Why? Well, first of all, human parental care surely has been importantly effect affected or shaped uh, by natural selection. I don't think anybody would deny that. And one mechanism, uh, somebody in the back says he did that. OK, we'll talk about that later. Uh, but uh, one mechanism that natural selection might exploit, this is just something in logical space, might exploit, is an ultimate desire for one's child's welfare. Okay. Now, the reason that this is a good strategic uh, strategy for Sober and Wilson to focus on is that parental care, of course, is not evolutionarily altruistic, quite the opposite. Parental care is evolutionarily, as it were, selfish, uh, right? You are doing uh, something that will, in fact, enhance uh, your own inclusive fitness. So concerns about evolutionary altruism here can just be put off to the side. If you think, as many biologists still do, that evolutionary altruism is impossible in a species like ours, fine. Irrelevant here because parental care isn't a case of evolutionary altruism. All right, so here's the game plan, and I'll give you a few quotes uh, because I think it's important to, uh, if I'm going to criticize them, tell you exactly what they say. So they say, we conjecture that human parents typically want their children to do well, to live rather than to die, to be healthy rather than sick, and so on. The question we'll address is whether this desire is merely an instrumental desire in the service of some egoistic ultimate goal, or part of a pluralistic motivational system in which there is an ultimate altruistic concern for the child's welfare. We will argue that there are evolutionary reasons to expect motivational pluralism to be the proximate mechanism for producing parental care in our species. And there's a crucial bit of jargon in here that needs to be unpacked. Uh, by motivational pluralism, they simply mean motivation that is, uh, <clears throat> involves both an egoistic and, crucially, an altruistic component. And, of course, as Sober and Wilson point out, uh, historically, either you've been an egoist or you've been a motivational pluralist. Nobody, nobody in his right mind, maybe even nobody who's insane, 
has ever thought that all human motivation is altruistic, so everybody's a motivation, pluralist or an egoist. The book goes on, uh, oddly actually, will focus on hedonism as the main competitor that the altruistic hypothesis must confront, because by pitting altruism against hedonism, we're asking the altruism hypothesis to reply to the version of egoism that's most difficult to refute. As just a footnote here, something I'm not going to pursue, this is a very, I've always found this passage very strange. Because after all, if uh, uh, hedonism is a subset of egoism, how can it be harder to refute hedonism than egoism? Uh, but that's a minor problem. I'll go with that uh, move. Uh, I think Sober and Wilson have much more interesting things to say and make a much more interesting mistake. All right. So the question now is, would natural selection prefer altruism or hedonism uh, when designing parental care or, for that matter, anything else? And Sober and Wilson argue, reasonably enough, uh, that there are three factors which influence the kind of solution that will evolve. Uh, availability, a trait must be present in an ancestral population in order to be selected, obviously. Uh, Reliability, uh, <clears throat> the better it does at achieving its goal, the better it is. Uh, and energetic efficiency, basically how much it costs to build the mechanism and to uh, use the mechanism once it's built. They go on to argue, and again, uh, I think this is very plausible, uh, that we have at this point no reason to think that hedonism and altruism differ either with regard to energetic efficiency or with regard to availability. Uh, but they maintain uh, an altruistic mechanism would be more reliable, and therefore, <clears throat> uh, and therefore, it's much more likely uh, that the altruistic mechanism would be the one that evolved. So that's the structure of their argument. Are they right? Well, uh, <clears throat> uh, as I'm forever telling my students uh, in debates uh, about cognitive mechanisms. The devil is in the details. So I think it's crucial at this point that we look at some of those details. Uh, so here is, uh, a, um, as we say at Rutgers, a boxology uh, for altruism. Uh, this is largely based on, uh, and I'll give you three of these, by the way. Uh, they're largely based on Sober and Wilson, uh, although they are a bit more detailed than what Sober and Wilson give us. Okay, so let me walk you through how all of this works. First of all, it's important that the color-coded, there's only one ultimate desire here. That's the ultimate desire to do what will be most helpful for my kids. That's an altruistic desire, right? It's an ultimate desire for the well-being of somebody else. How does the rest of it work? Uh, well, uh, up there uh, uh, is a fact in the world, uh, as we might say. Uh, my kid needs help. Uh, and that leads to the belief that my kid needs help. And there's a little skinny arrow over there. Well, of course, as people in the room uh, are uh, <clears throat> abundantly aware, that little skinny arrow is, uh, I don't know, 90% of what cognitive science is concerned about, uh, right? It's forming a belief, uh, typically a true belief at least, uh, <clears throat> uh, about the nature of the environment, okay? The reason, I'm not going to say anything at all about it, is that all three of these models uh, make the same assumption uh, that there is a mechanism in place enabling you to form a belief, typically a true one, uh, <clears throat> that your kid needs help when he does. So everything else is, uh, that's interesting uh, in these models is happening elsewhere. So you form the belief your kid needs help. Uh, other beliefs along with that one enable you to infer that some action, call it a star, is the best way to help. That interacts by standard practical reasoning uh, with the uh, ultimate, that is to say, altruistic desire to do what will be most helpful for your kid, uh, and uh, you form the desire to do that, and you do it. Well, um, here's a first form of hedonism, uh, which uh, Sober and Wilson call future pain hedonism. Uh, and notice what uh, happens. Can I go back? Yeah. Uh, notice what happens in this one is it's just growing something over to your left. Uh, this is now same desire, but it's instrumental rather than ultimate. Where does it come from? Well, the ultimate desire here is the hedonistic desire. Maximize pleasure, minimize pain. Right? But in order to get this from that, 
you need a belief, namely uh, the belief that if I don't do what will be most helpful for my kids, I'll feel lousy. Okay? Uh, so I'll feel guilty, I'll feel unpleasant, I'll feel bad in the future if I don't do what's most helpful for my kids. So that's future pain hedonism. And this is the one uh, they rightly describe it. I don't know whether this is a term widely known to this audience, but they rightly describe it as a Rube Goldberg invention uh, because it's so complicated. Uh, <coughs> it's the one they actually focus on, and I'll follow them in that, uh, that uh, we can call current pain hedonism. So let me walk you through this. You form the belief that your kid needs help, then up at the top there's an affective state. You feel bad because your kid needs help. Uh, you uh, need a belief there. You need to, uh, as it were, have a belief or knowledge about why you're feeling bad in that way. So you form that belief, right? That comes over here. Uh, then you've got your uh, egoistic, uh, hedonistic, in fact, ultimate desire, uh, plus a belief that if I feel bad because my kid needs help, then if I do what's most helpful for my kid, I'll stop feeling bad. Okay? Uh, well, uh, that then uh, <clears throat> produces this belief straightforwardly by theoretical reasoning. Practical reasoning gets you uh, the one that's doing the crucial work, uh, and you've got the help coming. Right, so there's current pain hedonism. And remember what Sober and Wilson want to argue uh, is that uh, altruism is more reliable than hedonism, in particular current pain hedonism. Well, to make that case, they offer four different arguments uh, for the greater reliability of altruism over current pain hedonism. Uh, for purposes of time, I'm going to skip three of those arguments uh, because I think they're easily refuted. And indeed, there's a paper I published last year in Biology and Philosophy, if you want to take a look at the easy ones to refute. What I want to spend the time I have on uh, is the much more interesting fourth argument, which I think is also mistaken, but from which I think we can learn uh, <clears throat> a great deal. So here's the argument. Uh, let me read it to you. Uh, <clears throat> more or less uh, totally. They suppose a hedonistic organism believes on a given occasion that providing parental care is the way for it to attain its ultimate goal of maximizing pleasure and minimizing pain. What would happen if the organism provides parental care but then discovers that its action fails to deliver maximal pleasure and minimal pain? If the organism is able to learn from experience it'll probably be less inclined to take care of its children on subsequent occasions. The instrumental desires, uh, sorry, instrumental desires tend to diminish and disappear in the face of negative evidence of this sort. This can make hedonistic motivation a rather poor control device. And they sum this up on the next page by saying, the instrumental desire will remain in place only if the organism is trapped by an unalterable illusion. And that's a crucial idea that will emerge uh, again quickly. So what do they have in mind? Here's current pain hedonism. That's the belief they're concerned about. Uh, they're concerned that that belief uh, <clears throat> might be undermined. What they're in effect saying is that uh, actually both versions of hedonism uh, rely on a specific and prima facie empirical belief. Uh, <clears throat> so it's this one in the case of current pain hedonism, uh, the belief that if I feel bad because my kid needs help, then if I do what's most helpful for my kids, I'll stop feeling bad. Uh, both versions of, hedon of hedonism rely on such a belief. But the point they're making is, look, that belief, like any other belief, could potentially be undermined, for example, by evidence. The evidence could be either good evidence in their case, or for that matter, even misleading evidence. We run across misleading evidence all the time. Or it could even be undermined by theoretical beliefs, uh, <clears throat> either uh, rational theoretical beliefs or irrational theoretical beliefs. Heavens knows there are plenty of the latter around. Uh, so uh, there are lots of ways that that crucial belief could be undermined. And that, they're saying, makes the process underlying parental care look extremely vulnerable to disruption. And it suggests that natural selection would likely opt for a more reliable way of getting this crucial job 
of parental care done. So again, here's the picture. What they're worried about is that evidence or theoretical reasoning might undermine that guy. And of course, if that guy goes, the rest of the system collapses and you don't get the parental care you need. So, have Sober and Wilson vindicated or at least made plausible psychological altruism on evolutionary grounds? I'm not persuaded. To explain why, I'm going to have to take a step back and take a closer look at the account of ultimate and instrumental desires uh, that Sober and Wilson are assuming, uh, along, by the way, with just about the entirety of the literature on altruism. Uh, and I want to look also at uh, the assumptions about the cognitive processes or the cognitive architecture that underlie that account uh, of ultimate instrumental desires. All right, so <clears throat> remember when I started uh, explaining these notions, I said an instrumental desire is a desire produced or sustained by a process of practical reasoning that looks like this. Yikes, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> that looks like that. Okay? But um, back then, I didn't say anything about the notion of belief uh, that I was uh, invoking in this process. I simply took it for granted. Indeed, uh, <clears throat> Sober and Wilson, uh, like just about everybody else in the literature, uh, seems to be, seem to be adopting a very standard view. Uh, the view that, roughly put, is that beliefs are inferentially integrated representational states that play a characteristic, of course, difficult to unpack, role in an agent's cognitive economy. Uh, that's the view of beliefs that I was presupposing and Sober and Wilson looked to be presupposing as well. What is it to say that a belief is inferentially integrated? Well, roughly speaking, it's to say that uh, that belief can be both generated and removed by inferential processes that can take any or maybe almost any or just about any other beliefs as premises, provided, of course, they have the right content and are related in the right way. But in the psychological literature, in the cognitive science literature, in the philosophy literature, there's a great deal of discussion, increasingly much in the last decade or 15 years, of belief-like cognitive states that in an important sense are much stickier than this picture of inferential integration suggests. These, I'll call them sticky, belief-like states, are harder to modify by changing other beliefs. Once you get them in, it's not so easy to get them out by inference. Well, in a paper I wrote roughly a zillion years ago, uh, I referred to these things as subdoxastic states. Uh, and they've since, not since, but over the last 25 years, they've become, as I say, increasingly important in the cognitive science literature. Uh, uh, perhaps the clearest example, uh, as uh, uh, um, uh, Pierre and Emmanuel point out in their uh, uh, paper in this area, grammatical rules uh, are, uh, that is to say, the rules underlying uh, linguistic comprehension and speech production, at least if Chomsky is right, uh, or uh, these sticky subdoxastic states. The argument I like for this is, look, if that weren't the case, the Rutgers Linguistics Department would be in deep trouble because we've got eight people interested in syntax. And they all have dramatically different theories about the syntax of English. And boy, if those beliefs affected their rules, right, uh, they'd end up babbled. Uh, but of course, the mere fact that they have dramatically different beliefs about the syntax of English has exactly no impact on the rules underlying uh, their production and comprehension of English. Another uh, well-known example uh, comes from the work of Sukari and Liz Spalke on what they call core beliefs. Uh, roughly speaking, again, core beliefs are cog belief-like cognitive states that underlie early inferences about the physical and mathematical properties of objects. They're innate. And really, uh, interestingly, they're unalterable. Uh, they're still lurking, even in adults, uh, even when you've acquired a theory that's incompatible with them. All right, uh, so <clears throat> those are just two examples among uh, dozens that uh, could be offered of these sticky, subdoxastic, belief-like states used in contemporary cognitive science. 
Well, now here's the way uh, the argument goes. Since subdoxastic states can play a role in inference-like interactions, think Spelke's work, Carey's work, Chomsky's work, these are all inference-like interactions, and since practical reasoning is an inference-like interaction, it's at least possible that subdoxastic states play a role, uh, <clears throat> play the belief role uh, in some episodes of practical reasoning. So instead of this, the picture of practical reasoning I gave you earlier, we might have something like this, where instead of a belief up here, we have a subdoxastic state. Well, uh, what makes this important for our current purposes is that if subdoxastic state one is difficult or impossible to remove, then there's going to be an all but unbreakable correlation between desire one and desire two over there. Uh, if you've got desire one, given that there's nothing that's going to get that out once it's in, uh, you're going to have desire two as well. All right, now one more question to ask. Suppose you've got a structure like that. Is desire two instrumental or ultimate? Well, remember the intuitive idea. Uh, <clears throat> The objects of ultimate desires are things that are desired for their own sake. But since uh, the object of desire too isn't desired for its own sake, but because it will uh, lead to something else, it looks most natural to say desire too is an example of an instrumental desire. Uh, but if that's the case, then Sober and Wilson's argument is in trouble. Why? Well, remember. That's the belief they're concerned about. They're concerned that it might be undermined by evidence, good evidence, bad evidence, theory, rational or irrational. Okay? But of course, if that's a sticky subdoxastic state, okay, then that desire can't be undermined by experience in the way that Sober and Wilson are worried about. And of course, that's the desire that does the work even on the altruist story. So, uh, where are we? Uh, I think we've shown uh, that Sober and Wilson haven't made their case that altruism is more reliable than hedonism. So yet another evolutionary argument about psychological altruism versus psychological egoism uh, bites the dust. All right. Oh, yes, there it goes. So uh, <clears throat> that's where we are in the uh, outline. And uh, what I want to do in the last few minutes uh, is now ask uh, against the background of what we've learned, why exactly should philosophers worry about psychological egoism? And I better get some more water before I try to do that. Well, remember where we started. Uh, we started with Hobbes and Bentham and Mill. And there we found a good reason, not this general and, and really quite mysterious, weird view that altruism is somehow identical with a presupposed, or presupposed morality or something like that. Uh, Bentham and Mill uh, were worried that psychological egoism, if it were true, would make pro-social behavior fragile. And this leads Mill in particular uh, to propose uh, dramatically draconian social structures to be sure that we don't have this fragile uh, underpinning of pro-social behavior. Right? Uh, so it comes across nicely in the, uh, the quote from Hobbes. Uh, the concern is that if people believe that behaving pro-socially won't lead to, as Hobbes puts it, their own good, then there'll be no beginning of, of benevolence or trust or of mutual help. But one lesson we can draw from the critique of Sober and Wilson uh, is that if Mother Nature, as Dan Dennett might say, or natural selection, or God, tell the story any way you want, if uh, any of these agents of design wanted to foster pro-social behavior in a given domain, she doesn't have to make us psychological altruists in that domain. It would be equally effective to make us psychological egoists, indeed, equally effective even to make us hedonists, uh, some kind of psychological egoist, uh, with an appropriate subdoxastic state. Okay? So uh, the thing to keep in mind is that this altruist, 
at Sober and Wilson's altruist, uh, will behave in exactly the same way as this egoist, provided that's uh, a sticky subdoxastic state and can't be undermined by evidence or theory. Of course, the egoist's uh, instrumental pro-social desire can from time to time be overridden by a stronger self-interested desire. That's obvious, but uh, that's neither here nor there uh, because as all altruists uh, concede, uh, uh, altruistic intrinsic pro-social desire can also from time to time be overridden by a stronger self-interested desire. Okay? So they're on a, all fours that, that way. Uh, so uh, what I want to conclude here is that contrary to what generations of philosophers, particularly social philosophers, people concerned uh, like Mill and Bentham with designing societies, uh, contrary to what they've assumed, pro-social behavior is no more fragile if psychological egoism is true than if psychological altruism is true. And just one last thought here. Uh, these are hard issues to debate because it's hard to get a neutral ground. But by my moral lights, at least, a psychological egoist, indeed even maybe a hedonist, but let me just say a psychological egoist who is reliably pro-social is more, uh, is more, uh, more sorry, is a more appealing, morally appealing person than a psychological altruist whose desire to help is ultimate if it's also unconnected to the affective life of that psychological altruist. Uh, so uh, my favorite example here is that arguably at least, I have no direct evidence on this, but arguably at least, Mother Teresa helped the wretched because she found their distress painful. And she found that alleviating their distress brought her joy. Uh, well, if that's true, as it well, might well be, no, those are the motivations, not of an altruist, but of a psychological egoist.